Yo, Mana Squad, if you like any of the cards you see in today's video, you can go ahead and show the channel some love with the affiliate link down below for TCG Player. TCG Player is going to have whatever it is you're looking for, and you can even search for some of your local game stores and buy from them and show them some love as well. And speaking of showing the channel love, another great way to do so is by rocking into the AM. Got the discount code on screen and down below. You can show us some love, look good in the process, and as Kennethy the Heathen loves to say, something about dripping in space and screaming. Yo! Welcome back to One More Mana. My name is Derek, and today we're talking about the top five most bruh-worthy cards in Outlaws of Thunder Junction. This set seems a little crazy, a little powerful, and kind of Avengers assemblage with cowboy hats on. I'm not super familiar with the lore, but let's be real. I don't think any of y'all are tuning in to watch me go into like an in-depth lore analysis. You want to see the unhinged. You want to see what cards are making me say, bro. And if you aren't familiar with what these videos are, it's about cards that make me feel some type of way. They might make me angry, excited, sad, or sitting here questioning the meaning of life. It's a whole spectrum of joy that magic brings me. So we're going to jump straight into this list and start with number five. And the number five most bro-worthy card in this set is going to be Molten Duplication. Molten Duplication is one in a red for a sorcery that basically does the Felden thing, except with a creature in place. So you're gonna make a token copy of a creature that you have. It's gonna be a artifact. It's gonna get haste and you're gonna sack it at the beginning of the next end step. So we're gonna start with the more, I guess, hinged, bruh, and then get to the unhinged. The, the hingedness for this card is, this seems really strong. <laughs> it just feels like two mana for a copy of whatever you have. Now, in like lower power level tables, you're gonna see cool stuff like OG Atali. You know what, maybe you don't have a way to give it haste, you can cast it Atali, play this, get a second one that's gonna have haste, swing with it, and then still keep your original one. You can do a lot of broken stuff in artifacts type decks because it's an artifact, so you can do the whole goblin welder thing where you're getting copies, getting value. Really that whole Felden engine that you see. So it just seems really strong, and I'm sure in more competitive tables, this is going to be used to copy many a dock side over the course of its existence. Because again, you can basically just two mana, get whatever broken ETB you had, or get a big attack trigger. It, it kind of has that cool spread of, seems like it'll be pretty good in, in stronger decks, but also like the casual, you're just playing big stompy stuff. You get a big hasty version of it to swing with. So overall, seems like a really effective, cool card. The problem I have with it is y'all basically just like plagiarized from Felden on this. So I don't who is it this art person with cowboy hat um Angeline I think that's what it says your name is give some props to Felden because look grandpa was the original one I realize grandpa's bringing stuff out the graveyard to give it this like artifact shell swingy thing but outside of the fact it's a graveyard didn't play it's kind of the same effect so like you know molten duplication maybe put in parentheses we definitely stole from Felden whoopsies like I feel like that's super fine look if we have enough room to put 17 paragraphs of text on a card we definitely have enough room to give a little tribute to my grandpa Felden. Number four most bro worthy card in this set is Chrom Violent Cacophony. Chrom is two, a red and a blue for a two, three flyer. Pretty simple effect whenever you cast a second spell each turn, gets a plus one counter draw card. The effect is not what I'm worried about. The thing I'm thinking about is look, this set has managed to put a cowboy hat on damn near everything. We got cacti with cowboy hats. We got scorpion dragons with cowboy hats. I have seen versions of cowboy hats I did not know exist in order to keep the, the kind of the theme of this set going. And you look at Krom, which has two big old round heads just sitting there perfect for a cowboy hat. And look, if, if you know what, maybe two is too much. Maybe there is a certain rule in the junction of outlaws that is this plain one cowboy hat per person. That's fine. Get creative. Make it like a double. Are the big hats like the four gallon hats? Make an eight gallon hat, just like bam, bam, just double. Maybe just one just big ass hat that fits both heads. I feel like Krom's being left out. Now there is the possibility that like flying with lightning speed through the sky, the hat fell off. If that's the case, make better cowboy hats. It's not fair that Krom has to go flying around. Look, as someone who shaves their head regularly, you're flying around in the desert at night. That is cold as, yeah, it, it's incredibly cold. Not fair. We don't want Krom getting sick. Krom's already a zombie. Basically died once. If it dies again, that's going to be a whole nother issue. Look, show some love to Krom. You have the cowboy symbol, hat symbol in the little card corner. You know what? Just edit, take it out, put it on somebody's head. Krom does not deserve to be left out. Neither head does. Zombie Krom, I got you. We're looking out for you. And bruh, it's not fair that you got the short end of the stick on this. Now, the number three most bro worthy card in this set is going to be Yuma Proud Protector. I'm going to go on a little rant here. We're going to talk about card design and things because Yuma is, is making me say bruh for a few reasons. Yuma's got a lot going on. If you're not familiar, it's five red, green, white for a six, six human ranger 
costs one less to cast for each land in your graveyard. When it ETBs or attacks, you sack a land and draw a card. And then when you have a desert go into your graveyard from anywhere, you get a 4-2 token with reach. It's just a lot of text on there. This card, why it makes me say, bro. Look, so we're going to get into some of my favorite card designs of all time. We're getting a little aside mixed in. Crash, great example of a card. I think that is almost perfect card design. Incredibly simple. Creatures die, it gets plus one counters. It gives you all the freedom in the world. Whether you want to make big creatures and sack them. Whether you want to be the one removing your opponent's creatures. You can do an edict style deck. Maybe give it an indestructible board wipe style deck. Lose all your friends. Whatever you want to do, Crush is there for it. You can make it a fling deck. There are so many different directions to take it. And it's such a simple effect. You sit down at a table. Someone plays Crush. Everyone knows what it does after two seconds. It's awesome. It's simple yet complicated in the way you can take it a bunch of different directions. Felden, shout out to Grandpa again, is another great example of a commander that is a very simple effect. Reanimate thing out of graveyard, get big, artifact, copy, haste, dies at end of turn. But you can take it in so many directions because of that simplicity. It's not telling you where to go. You can do artifact theme, Eldrazi theme, big ass creature themed. I've seen people go goblin with it. You can do kind of whatever you want within it and take it in a bunch of directions. But at the same time, when someone reads Felden, it's 20 seconds. Okay, I know exactly what this card does. I don't need a, a, a map. And we'll, probably one of my favorite card designs of all time, which was really the comparison point of like a 2014 card getting 2024 atized. Titania Protector of Argoth has been my favorite, if not you know, tied for my favorite deck for it's going on six years now. And Titania is one of those designs I absolutely love. Titania enters, you get a land back. So you get ramp, you have to earn it by putting things in your graveyard before she ever touches the battlefield. And the second effect, you have to have a land go from, from the battlefield to the graveyard to go ahead and get your tokens. And it really made me think about the whole kind of concept of restrictions breeding creativity and how does that work? What type of restrictions do I like to see? And I really realized there's basically two types of restrictions. There's one that restrict kind of what you can do with the deck, basically telling you you have to go in this direction you're restricted or making what you want to do more difficult. And, and I'll explain what that means. So basically Titania is a good example. It's telling you a land has to go from the battlefield to the graveyard. You can't discard it. You can't mill it. You can't do anything else. So you immediately are told, look, this is the specific thing, but there's a million different ways to make that work. A good example, it's kind of like restricting how much it can go off, essentially. A great example is when they put only once per turn or only at sorcery speed on cards. To me, it's not restricting creativity. It's restricting what the card's going to do in the course of a game to try to kind of balance it, maybe make it a little bit more tame. With Titania, while she has those specific abilities, for me, she's one of the most open-ended and fun lands commanders because of the fact that she has to do with lands, but doesn't say the word landfall. She's not telling you to put lands into play. It's in, it's just kind of like implied because you need them to leave the battlefield, but it never says that. You can build Titania as just a straight up tokens deck and just have fetch lands, evolving wilds, things like that as your means of building your tokens with her. You can go all in on landfall and have a bunch of landfall creatures and then use her as the finisher when you sack all the lands you've gotten in all game. Or you could even do the build that I've done a deck tech for that I'll throw in the description where it's more of a lands matter, where it's not lands entering, but it's using cool utility lands like Dark Depths and Maze of Ith and Mouth of Renome and Field of the Dead. And the lands themselves become your spells. All of those builds work exceptionally well for Titania and she's powerful enough to hold all those up. But it's because of that weird restriction of battlefield to graveyard. You have to make that work, but there's no restriction within that. Now that's going to take us over to the type of restrictions that Yuma mentions. Yuma just reminds me so much of so many of the commanders that we see now in 2024, where it's setup, engine, and payoff all on one card. Alluding to Titania again, with Titania, to, in order to get setup, you need to have ways to get those lands into your graveyard to really have even the benefit of playing it out. You, if you want card draw, if you want all that other stuff, you need to have enchantments and stuff in a play to benefit off of playing big creatures. And even as a finisher, you need to find other ways to sack lands to get those tokens. And it's basically telling you, this is what you can do. Go find out how to do it. With Yuma, you have the, the first ability I absolutely love. It reminds me almost of Carador in the sense of it's discounting for a number of lands in your graveyard. Super cool, already super on board. But I would have loved for that second ability to be something more simplistic to get basically saying, you play a, a desert from your graveyard, get a token. You sacrifice a desert, you get a token. And then making you figure out how to do it from there. The fact that it's giving you the engine, so entering, sack a land, draw a card, also makes you a token. Or attack, you're going to be able to sack a land, make another token, also draw a card. It's doing everything for you. 
Now, this is not me just being like, ugh, card design, bad, ugh. Like, no, like if you put me in charge of card design, it, magic would cease to exist in like six months. It, it, it's not it's not easy, it's hard. And the other thing is tons of people love this. I have a lot of friends that love this style of commander where it is the engine. They wanna just be able to worry about the fun stuff to throw in their deck. They don't wanna be concerned with having to construct perfectly a deck top to bottom for it to work. They want a fun commander that's gonna do all the hard work and put fun stuff in, which is also super cool. For me though, I love and have that nostalgia for those older commanders that do something strong, do something very simple and make you figure everything else out. So all that, that whole rant is to say, bruh, I appreciate them trying to, you know, put some training wheels on some of these commanders, make it more kind of friendly to people just getting into building commander decks and things like that. But one thing I will say is, and it is a pre-con, so I guess that's the whole point, but bruh, make some of those like real simple commanders, like make the face of a pre-con one line of text, just real simple. Bring in some of those, those creches, those Feldens, those Titanias. And sometimes some of us out there, the, the masochists that love to play like Dark Souls and, and Bloodborne and those types of things, we like to earn everything. We like to go in and have to construct the engine. We like to have to build the setup and build the finisher. And there is a beauty in that. So this is just a, a, a brush shouting out some of the older commanders and Bro, all I'm gonna say is if I play against you, it's gonna be scary because that card does everything for you. All right, rant over. We're gonna get into the number two most bro worthy card in this set. This is gonna be a much more uh, simple uh, explanation and definitely uh, slightly more unhinged. So we'll get into Gold Vein Hydra. It's green and X for a Hydra. Vigilance Trample Haze, because obviously it needs a million keywords. And then it enters with X plus one counters. When it dies, create a number of tap treasure tokens equal to its power. This is the most excited bruh ever. Like, bruh, this is beautiful. Tapped treasure should be the same thing. Every treasure should be tapped. That's my little aside. Treasures coming in to untapped. The way I see treasures coming in untapped is basically like the equivalent of like you go into like a store. Let's say you're going to buy magic cards and like, bam, you purchase immediately. Oh, you just bought cards. Here's more money. Now you got to sit there and think about, oh, well, I didn't even realize I was going to get more money. Now I got to buy mo more cards. And then you got to sit and think about that. And then you buy those more cards and you get more money for buying the cards. And then it turns into like a two hour adventure of trying to figure out what cards you want. Yeah, that's what the turns feel like when people start making treasures and then sacking those treasures to make more treasures. And you're sitting there 35 minutes later, everyone's on their phone. The treasure player still doesn't know what they're going to do because they keep being surprised by how much treasure they have. It's a whole mess. The tap thing is beautiful. It's like, you know what? You go into your LGS, maybe you buy some stuff, you get some rewards. You have time to sit back and think and let those rewards collect over time and then figure out what you want and make an informed decision. That's what these tap treasures are. You get the treasures, but you can't use them right away. You have to wait. You can sit there, sit back and allow things to develop. There's something, I think Commander is, for me, is like a lazy river sometimes. I wanna see the beautiful cards. I wanna take my time getting there. And if every treasure token came in tapped, I feel like it would allow, it allows the table to respond. If you make 30 treasures off of this, you're not bam, just winning the game. Everyone has a chance to be like, oh, okay, figure this out. And it is beautiful. And I get it. It's a really strong card, tons of keywords. I'm probably going to do broken stuff anyway, but something just makes me so happy about seeing like the very kind of like pushed mythic having the word tap treasures on it. And that is the happiest, bro, that you'll get out of me. That is wonderful to see. Now, the number one most bro worthy card this one's funny. We're talking about strong cards and like pushed things and everything. And this one, this one made me say, bro, because I literally just read it. It was like, okay, that's fine. And then revisited it like a week later. I was like, oh my God, I have, could be completely desensitized to, to what a strong magic card is. Now we're going to talk about the Gitrog Ravenous Ride, bro. The, the, this card is a ride. It is three, a black and a green for a six, five trample haste frog horror mount. Oh, it's got saddle one, so you can, it's kind of like almost like crewing a vehicle except for a creature. Whenever the Gitrog Ravenous Ride deals combat damage to a player, you can sacrifice a creature. If that, that was saddled. So whatever kind of you tap, saddle it, bam, you can go ahead and sack that when it deals damage. If you do, you draw X cards and then put X land cards from your hand onto the battlefield tapped where X is the sacrifice creature's power. I, I don't have, I mean, I have words because y'all know I can't stop talking, but I'm also at a loss for words, which is this. I, I read it the first. I was like, okay, cool. New get rock, nothing. And then I'm thinking about it. And this is like, if you let this car connect, you're in black and you're in green. So you're going to get this out, maybe turn three or turn four consistently. So a six, five trample haze turn three or four is going to connect. If you have ever played the type of deck, like a Galta or even a crash or a power matters type deck, there are a lot of creatures with very high power that are just chump fodder it is so easy for this deck to essentially draw half of its deck and just throw all the lands into play in just a few turns this is the thing that's 
the, the shocked me about this is I should have read this and immediately been appalled, terrified, and just putting remove target get rog from all my decks just because it's like, okay, this is going to be a problem for me. I play in stompy pods. This is going to do some damage in stompy pods. And the fact that I read this and thought nothing is wrong, this seems fine. And it took me like a literal week later. Yeah, bro. Uh, that's, I, I've been completely desensitized. This is like, <laughs> it's funny. I've enjoyed parts of, of Power Creep, honestly, because it gets, lets me play more mean things and it seems like it's fine. I can play my Titania deck more often. I can play more removal. I can do all these cool things that used to be too mean back in the day. But bro, I'm starting to get worried. If I don't react to that, it's it's all downhill from here. My radar is completely off and um, I think I'm going to regret that. I'm probably going to get killed by Gitrog a lot and he's going to remind me that I should have never forgotten about the Gitrog monster. And that's going to do it for this week's video. I really hope y'all enjoyed it. Despite all my rants, this set seems amazing. The commander decks seem super fun. I am a huge fan of everything going on. I, I love seeing all the legends kind of popping back up, especially like when you get attached. I, I remember how excited I was. I talked about Titania for half this video, despite she's not in it. When we got a meld one in the Brothers War, I was ecstatic and couldn't believe that we got another version of it. I imagine all the Gitrog players being so excited. I imagine all of the, the you know, the, the Gaunti players seeing there's a new Gaunti and they're getting, and that is the awesome part because if you've become attached to a commander over time, look, every new legend in the set doesn't have to be for every single person, but the people that connect with it, I know the excitement of seeing one of my favorite commanders reimagined. So seeing as many as there are is, is really cool. And why not throw some cowboy hats on? But let me know down in the comments below what y'all think. What are the cards in this set that made y'all say, bruh, made you question everything? Does this set seem as strong as I think it is? Because it feels like there's a lot going on. Just let me know everything in the comments below. But until next time, stay petty.